Welcome to Science for the Non-Scientists. In this video, I'm going to talk about recent scientific work that explores the link between oxytocin and autism. Uh, this publication was done by scientists at the Johns Hopkins University and the University of Pennsylvania, both in the United States, and is going to officially appear on Neuron on November 25th, 2020. Let's talk for a moment about oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that is produced in the hypothalamus, which is this region of the brain. Uh, just uh, as an FYI, this region is also responsible for things such as our sleep-wake cycles and for temperature regulation within our bodies. So the hypothalamus has these neurons called the magnocellular neurons and the parvocellular neurons, and these neurons produce oxytocin. Oxytocin has a number of functions. So the oxytocin that's produced by these magnocellular neurons is released into the bloodstream, and in females is very important for birth and for milk secretion. I should say for giving birth and for milk secretion after the birth. On the other hand, these parvocellular neurons produce oxytocin that is released into other parts of the brain and has important functions in both men and women. Specifically, it's been thought to be associated with social reward, meaning that when we interact socially with our peers, we feel good. And this um, makes us want to keep doing that in the future. So let's talk a little about a little bit about autism. Individuals who have autism, as we, many of us know, have difficulty interacting socially with peers. They don't find it pleasurable necessarily. And uh, they also, because their brains work differently, have a hard time understanding what their peers are thinking or what they're feeling. And so it makes social interactions very difficult. Autism, we think, is a very complex um, condition. There are many different causes. But the most common genetic cause of autism is this syndrome called Fragile X syndrome. In this syndrome, these patients have a mutation on this FMR1 gene that's located on the X chromosome. And so they don't make this FMR protein. So on the left here is what a normal X chromosome looks like. On the right is what a Fragile X chromosome looks like. Because of the mutations in the gene, this chromosome is more prone to breakage and damage, hence fragile X. Just to remind you, females have two X chromosomes, whereas males have one X and one Y chromosome. So because both men and women, males and females have an X chromosome, they're both susceptible to fragile X syndrome. Because females have two chromosomes, and if they, let's say, have one normal X chromosome that can produce some of the protein, they're less likely to have severe symptoms or as severe symptoms as males from this fragile X syndrome. The way that this, the, this gene damage causes fragile X is, is pretty fascinating. So in fragile X, what happens is that there are uh, little repeats of DNA, little sequences of DNA that are repeated on the chromosome hundreds of times in Fragile X. Now, normally, we only have about five to 44 repeats. So CGG, 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 and so on, up to maybe about 44 times. However, when the number of these repeats is expanded greatly, you get symptoms and it leads to Fragile X syndrome. All right, so how do we study autism? Obviously, it is uh, very difficult to do experiments, especially genetic experiments, in humans with autism. And so researchers turn to a mouse model. And what they've done is they've taken out this gene, this fMR1 gene. So it's called an fMR1 knockout mouse. And it's been genetically removed so that mice are born without this gene and hence without any protein production, this fMR1 protein production. And in different tests, these mice behave in a way that would suggest they have autistic features, 
similar to humans. So this is the experiment, the social conditioned place preference test that can show us how these mice behave differently than normal mice. So we start with putting a mouse in its home cage for seven days where it becomes acclimated. Then you put it in a chamber that has a, um, a door between it with two different types of bedding represented here by blue and green. And the mouse is allowed to explore these two different beddings for 30 minutes and scientists record its preference. How much time does it spend in each bedding? After that, they do an experiment where they have the mouse only on one bedding in a closed container with another mouse. And so this is sort of social conditioning. The mouse gets used to associating a peer with this specific type of bedding. This is followed by an isolation conditioning where on the other type of bedding, the mouse is alone for 24 hours and so associates this bedding with isolation. After this experiment, it's allowed to uh, freely explore the two beddings in this initial chamber again for 30 minutes. And again, scientists record what its preference is, how long it likes to spend on each side. The idea here is that um, if a mouse prefers social interaction, no matter what its preference is initially, it's going to gravitate towards spending more time in the bedding associated with social interaction than with isolation. So when we look at the data, we're comparing here wild type mice or mice that, are, that don't have this gene missing, and then these knockout mice. And you can see that on average, the mice, the, the wild type mice increase the amount of time that they spend in the chamber associated with the social interaction. And these are the individual trajectories of these mice. On the other hand, these knockout mice show no difference in which chamber they prefer based on social, um, social cues or isolation. So here, NS means non-significant. So even though it looks like they uh, spend more time in isolation after the experiment, this is not significant with an experimental error. So you can think of this as really, there's not enough data to detect a difference between pre and post. The important thing is that they definitely don't prefer to spend time on the social cued bedding as the wild type mice do. And so this feature is something that we think uh, marks these mice as having autistic qualities. They avoid social interaction. So the fact that they don't like the social interaction or don't respond to social reward doesn't mean that they don't respond to any kinds of reward. And in fact, to show that, the scientists then did a cocaine place preference test where they repeated the same experiment, except instead of social and isolation cues, they gave them either cocaine for 30 minutes or saline or salt water for 30 minutes. And not surprisingly, like humans, these mice preferred to be on the bedding associated with cocaine. Now, the interesting thing is that both the wild type and the knockout mouse, the knockout mice, preferred to be on the bedding associated with cocaine. So these knockout mice, these autistic mice, don't respond any differently to addictive drugs. They only respond differently to social reward cues. How is this related to oxytocin? Well, as we mentioned, these parvocellular neurons produce oxytocin that's responsible for social reward, whereas these magnocellular neurons associated with oxytocin that's secreted into the bloodstream and, and doesn't really have anything to do with social rewards. One could hypothesize that if you could specifically take out this fMR1 gene from these neurons, the one associated with social reward, but not these neurons, the ones associated with birth and milk secretion, perhaps you would see more autistic symptoms. All right, and this is what the scientists did. This is the experiment they did. 
they removed these, they removed this FMR1 gene from these parvocellular neurons only. So only the neurons that are associated with social reward, they took away this gene. And uh, what they saw was that this had similar results as the knockout mice. The wild type mice prefer the social bedding and um, uh, these FMR1 gene knockout mice, okay, from the parvocellular neurons did not show much preference, did not show any preference for going towards the social bedding. On the other hand, when they knocked this FMR1 gene, and to knock out means to take out. When they took this gene out from the magnocellular neurons, the ones that are associated with birth and milk secretion, there was no difference in these mice. They both wanted to go towards the social bedding. So it seems that you know, taking away this gene specifically from the neurons that make oxytocin associated with social reward causes these autistic-like symptoms where you don't have any desire to be socially um, interactive with your peers. All right, so what are the conclusions? Well, the experiment showed that in mice, again, it's important to realize this is mice and not humans, but in mice, removing this autis autism gene, okay, from neurons that secrete oxytocin for the social interaction rewards, but not from the neurons that are associated with birth and milk secretion, cause mice to not value social interaction as much. And from these results, the scientists suggest that oxytocin release into the brain might be disrupted in autistic individuals. This biological fact might result in the behavioral symptoms that we see within individuals that have autism. Caveat here, of course, is that this is in mice, and though it's the closest that perhaps we can get to studying autism easily, these are not humans, and so uh, the biology and the symptomatology, the, the symptoms we see, will probably differ a bit between humans and mice. I hope you enjoyed this video and see you next time for another Science for the Non-Scientist. Thank you very much.